You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Buddy Romer, the former governor of Louisiana. Governor, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. Look forward to our conversation. Me too, sir. Now, before we get into the reason for the interview, which is you entering the 2012 presidential election, I just want to go through a little bit briefly about your biography, because it is pretty amazing. Sometimes you meet these people who have done so many things in their lives, and you wonder, what are you doing wrong? <laughs> and I know you probably have the attitude, like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do more, but like most of these folks like you do. But I just want to let the listeners know a little bit about you, because it is pretty amazing. All right, fair enough. Thank you. Now, you were born, happy birthday, if this is correct. I'm getting this information mostly from the Internet, from Wikipedia. It says you were born October 4th of 1943. Is that right? That's correct. I'm 68 years old as of two weeks ago. My oh, God, 68. <laughs> 68 68 years young, right? I know. Right. I remember giving my graduation speech when I was in high school. I was one of these. I was a smart student, so I, I gave the graduation speech. And I remember looking out on the front row in the football stadium. It was packed. And my mother and dad and my four brothers and sisters were there. And I thought how old my dad was. He was 35. Wow. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. Unfortunately, I'm getting there, too. And that's what I was going to talk about, actually. So you were born in Shreveport, Louisiana, and in your high school, you were the valedictorian. I was. I didn't use those words, but it's true. Mm -hmm. It shows you that every dog has his day. That After, was my day. I was a master of the high school. <laughs> That's impressive. That is impressive. And, and <laughs> After high school, you went to Harvard. You graduated, I guess, in 1964. I did. 1964, you graduated Harvard, right? I did. I was the youngest student in my class. I was 16 when I got to Harvard. Again, very impressive. And 1967, you graduated from Harvard Business School with an MBA. I did. And you continued to astound because after college, you founded not one but two banks. Is that right? I did. My first bank was purchased by one of these big, mean, regional banks that really offered us way too much money. I said to myself, these guys are in trouble, man, if they're paying this much money. But I made an offer that we couldn't refuse. I was preparing to run for Congress, so it was the right time. They made the offer at the right time. I was ready to sell. And then, of course, in 1981, well, from 1981 to 1988, you were in the House of Representatives from the Correct. representing the 4th District of Louisiana. I was a Democrat, conservative. I was a bull weevil. I helped form the organization that gave Ronald Reagan his majorities in the House. The Republicans, if you remember, back in the 80s, were a minority in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And I formed a group of men and women, congressmen, who felt that when the president was right, we should be with him on military defense, on building up small businesses, on balancing the budget, on cutting taxes. We were with President Reagan about 70% of the time. Right. And, of course, the level of partisanship that exists today did not exist the way it does, obviously. No, it didn't. It was a different world in a lot of respects. And, quite frankly, I think a better world in a lot of respects in that ideas were judged for their quality, not their source. And lobbyists didn't give checks. They presented their views, which has been as legitimate as this country is. Now these things are different, and now it's about money, and politicians are about re-election, and I think too often what's good for the country is lost in the hustle to raise money, and it's something we'll talk about in this campaign. In many ways, I think America has become like Louisiana used to be. Louisiana used to be a bought place. It used to be a place not for what you knew, but for who you knew. It used to be a place where corruption was a wink and a nod. And it hurt the state. We had the highest unemployment rate in America, 12.8% when I was sworn in as governor. We had the worst paid teachers. We had the worst roads. We had the worst bond rating. People were leaving our state. That's what corruption does. Corruption leads to very wealthy at the top and right. very poor at the bottom. The 1%. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. I think that's happening in America now. It's my issue, and we'll talk about it, but that's why I got involved in politics in the first place, mm -hmm. was to try to change that. Right. You certainly didn't need to get involved in politics. I for... didn't. I enjoyed private life. I do. That's a very good point. But I think every citizen has an obligation, at least the way I was raised, to make the community better, to offer advice and counsel and try to improve things, and I've been lucky enough to do that. 
And after you left the House in 1988, from that same year till 92, you served as the 52nd governor of Louisiana. Is that right? I did. I was elected as a Democrat and then changed pretty. After I served for a couple of years, once again, corruption caused my action. I'm the only governor in American history to change parties while in office. And it was a state run by one party, the Democratic Party. The legislature was 97% Democrat. Wow. And that does not foster debate or transparency or fight corruption. So I changed parties to fight corruption. So you came in in 1988 and you switched in 1991. Correct. A couple of years into your term. Now that was 1992. Now we're in 2011. You want to run for president. Why do you want to run for president? The issues that we've talked about concern me. I think this is a nation that no longer listens to its own people. I think Washington has become so expensive and the lust for power so great that elected men and women don't serve their constituents as they once did. They really serve the need to raise money. There's a fundraiser a day in Washington, and the bills aren't read. The representatives don't have time. They're not raising money. And so I started looking at a presidential election for a nation that was in serious trouble, debt we couldn't repay, jobs that we no longer make, competition that was overrunning us. We were addicted to foreign oil. We refused to drill for natural gas in our own country, and yet we paid billions of dollars for foreign oil. Why is that? All of these questions. I went to China as a businessman, as a banker, serving my clients here in America, and I found out that trade was very unfair, that you couldn't get one of our products into China, yet their products were just overrunning our stores, and they were made by children, and they were made by prison labor. And they were made under working conditions that would be illegal in this country. And yet we let them come in with no tariff, no tax. For 160 years, from George Washington to Theodore Roosevelt, we protected our manufacturers from unfair competition. After World War II, we decided not to do that. And it's killing America. So I saw all of these things. Just the power of special interest money. And I said, you know, I think somebody ought to run for president who's free to tell the truth. And once having told it, is free to lead. And so I started looking for a candidate. And I couldn't find one in the Republican Party. Now, I knew the Democrats weren't going to give me one. I mean, they're married to union money and big corporate money. So they're not going to be free to lead. So I thought maybe the Republicans, I've been a Republican for 20 years, love my party, and I said, we'll find somebody here. Hell, I couldn't find anybody. They were all corporate people who took million-dollar checks, or they had been in political office election after election after election, and they were married to the corrupt system. And so I said, look, I'm going to not take PAC money. Just like I run for governor, I took no PAC money. I'm not going to take super PAC money, $100 limit. I'll have full disclosure. People will know who I am, where I am, and who gives me money. And I will gain power as president, free to lead. I will attack unfair trade. I will revise the tax code. I will reduce spending over five years to balance the budget without hurting people in need. I will be energy independent or deregulate small business. And I won't be dependent on a party or on a politician. I will be dependent on the people. And that's my campaign. I'm talking with the people. Okay. Now, the way that I found out about your presidential run was from a Reuters article. Besides that Reuters article, which the headline states, Inside Bunny Romer's Unlikely White House Run, have there been other mainstream media articles about your run? A few. I don't want to exaggerate it. I have gotten favorable press. I just haven't gotten much of it. It's interesting. At a $100 limit, I have raised money from all 50 states. California is a big giver to me, Florida, Texas, but I haven't made a single debate yet, although I'm the only guy running for president who was elected to Congress and as governor of his state. I find it very interesting that I can't quite make the national debate where the same old guys saying the same old things, and I think fewer and fewer people are listening. Why can't I make a debate? And it might be because I don't take the money.
and they don't want that conversation to be held on the national stage. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's because I'm 2% in the polls. But that was seventh place in Florida last week. I had three people who were in the debate. I was ahead of Rick Santorum. I mean, I was ahead of Jim Huntsman. I was ahead of Gary Jensen, two governors and a former senator. I mean, I think my message is catching on. I'm the only guy running who hasn't made a debate. Fascinating. How can the listeners help you get into the debate series? We present a schedule of upcoming debates, the sponsors and their addresses, on our website. And if you would permit me, I would give out my website. It's buddyromer.com, and Romer is spelled R-O-E-M-E-R. My two issues are corruption. I don't take the money. That's the only way to fight it. And jobs. I will stand up to China to unfair trade, and we will turn this nation around. Get on my website. I'll take a contribution if you'd like. It can be fabulous. It can't be more than 100 My average contribution is 64 or $65. We've paid our bills. I noticed a candidate in the paper this morning. He owed $3 million. Another candidate owed 600000 We don't owe a penny. We pay our bills. We're fighting in New Hampshire. That's where I'm going to make my stand. And people can help. Get on the website and join up. I need volunteers. I need strong, honest people. I need people unafraid to stand up to Wall Street or Washington, D.C. I hope that average Americans take up the call because we need somebody like you in there. In this article, you call Congress a circus where the clowns just rotate. I think a lot of listeners would probably have a different word for those people besides clowns or other than clowns. <laughs> and decries the fact that there is not – a lot of them consider them, consider them traitors and decries wow. the fact that there is neither disclosure nor limits on the millions of dollars likely to be spent by shadowy political oh, organizations. Right. No. People don't know how their government is financed. I'm telling you, folks, forget I'm running for president. Just let me be uh, one of your special reporters, David, a guy who was elected four times to Congress and never took any PAC money. And all the congressmen laughed at him. You can't get reelected. I did every time. They never whipped me because I made money the issue, and I was able to work in my party and to work across my party. When I thought my party was wrong, hell, I did not hesitate. This is America, man. We need to build a nation, and you start at the center and work out as president. I can't do this by myself. I mean, I'll be on your show as president, and we'll talk about the first 100 days, and we'll see how difficult it is, how you have to get down to two or three things. Campaign reform, don't let the lobbyists bring checks. Make it illegal. Put criminal penalties in it. 48-hour reporting period. We live in the world of electronics. The voters ought to be able to know within 48 hours of when you receive a check, who paid you and for what. This is information. We live in an information world, and we're going to make those changes in Washington. Now, it's not going to be easy, but I did in Louisiana, and I didn't get a single political endorsement when I ran for governor, and I passed every piece of legislation I have. We turned that state around, and it didn't take long, and we'll do the same thing in Washington. I won't get a single political endorsement, but the Congress will come to me because they know I'm a congressman. They know I'm elected by the American people. They know I use my bully puppet. They know I will veto every bill that busts the budget or corrupts the system. They know in their hearts that America will only be strong again when it's clean in the center. And the problem is Washington, D.C. I'll take a broom and sweep it out as president. Gee, I wonder why they don't want to have you on the debates. <laughs> yeah. My friends say, it's no question, buddy. They'd rather not hear from you. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. Now, let me give you that website again. It's Buddy Romer. It's B-U-D-D-Y-R-O-E-M-E-R, BuddyRomer.com. Governor Romer, I want to thank you so much for the time you took out of your day explaining all this to the listeners. And hopefully they'll go to that website and hopefully something will happen. You get in the debate. I think it'll be done. People will hear you speak and we'll have a new president. I'll take you up on that interview. You think Herman Cain was something? In 30 days, he went from 3% to 30%. Watch me, guys. If we get on the debate, watch what happens. And you can take an interview, man. It's a done deal, Dave. Governor Romer, thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.